Well, if you have your Bible, I want to invite you to open it to Romans chapter 1. We are in our final series, or final message of our You Pick series. And so you picked, or one of you did, maybe a few of you, uh, picked Romans 1. And it's a tall task to preach this entire chapter in one message, as you'll probably notice um, on the outline. There's a lot there, so um, we'll see if I can get through all of it. Uh, And I trust that I will, by God's grace. Romans chapter 1, 16 chapters in this letter. And the title of this sermon is, We Are Servants Set Apart for the Gospel. Anchor point, we are servants set apart for the gospel. It's the big idea of this entire chapter, and there are other, other ideas that link to this big one. As a church, we are servants set apart for the gospel. Secondly, what I want us to see here is that we are blessed by and under obligation to preach the gospel, and we are unashamed of the gospel because we know that it is not a mere message. And because it's not a mere message, we realize the necessity of the gospel. So that's where we're going uh, this morning in Romans chapter 1. First, Getting right into it, we are servants set apart for the gospel of God. Paul is the author of this letter, and here's what he says in in verse 1. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Very clear. After God saved Paul, you can read about that in Acts chapter 9. The entire focus of his life shifted, and it became consumed with one thing, Jesus Christ and the gospel of God. Christ blood purchased him, and Paul knows he now owns me. Christ now stands in the highest possible place in my life. And though Paul here had a unique calling as an apostle, Anyone who has been saved as a ser- is a servant of Christ and is set apart for the gospel. Listen, everybody in this room, you know Christ, our church. We belong to Christ, do we not? He purchased us. He owns us. We don't own ourselves. He owns us. And he has set us apart to be servants of his and for his gospel. And Paul shows, as we go on here, the nature of the gospel. That it was promised beforehand, and the gospel is about his son, God's son. Look at it. Verse 2, which he, that's God the Father, promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son. So before the gospel appeared, it had been promised long ago, and it was written in a book. The Holy Scriptures here refer to the Old Testament. So the gospel of God had been spoken about for centuries, and it was with regard to his son, his only son. So who's that? Well, we get a little bit of a clue, some clues. Continuing in verse 3, he was descended from David according to the flesh, was declared to be the Son of God, in power according to the Spirit of holiness, by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. So there's two things here about God's Son that we believe here as a church. First, verse 3, he descended from David And he was declared to be the son of God in power. Everybody see that? Descended from David, declared to be the son. In the power of his resurrection. So, verse 4, the Old Testament referred to a future descendant of David. Who would be the true king. And true representative of Israel. And when he was born, read about that in the Gospels. And through his life, he was declared to be what? The son of God. 
So the gospel of God is all about the Son of God. And he was descended from David, declared to be the Son in power by his resurrection. And then Paul wastes no time and says, here's his name. His name is Jesus Christ. And he describes him. He is our Lord. Anchor points say, he is our Lord. Who's our Lord? Jesus. Jesus Christ. Jesus demonstrated his divine power when he lived, read about this in the Gospels, by many signs and wonders. But the power that Paul has in mind here is his resurrection from the dead. This power introduced to the world a kind of power that overcomes death. It is a power the like of which the mightiest human force has yet to accomplish. And his resurrection was according to the supernatural and divine power, he says, of the spirit of holiness, which is a reference to the Holy Spirit. In other words, this is a supernatural event, the resurrection. Jesus Christ was declared the Son of God by that. And consequently, he is our Lord. This means that he is the rightful owner and ruler of our lives, anchor point. Do you know that? You don't own your life. You don't. It's not yours to live. It's Christ's. And we obey Christ. We follow Christ. We talk a lot about Christ. That's what Lord means. In verse 5, Paul goes on, through whom, here's the benefits, we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among the nations, including you who are, call, who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Now, we have some grammar work here to do. Be true to the grammar of the text. Everybody see, through whom we have received grace and apostleship. That's not you and me, by the way, this, this um, pronoun. This is a reference to Paul and the apostles. We, the apostles, we've received grace and apostleship. Biblically speaking, apostleship is not a contemporary gift to Christians at large, at least not in the same way as Paul. Jesus, we are told in Ephesians, appointed the apostles to do the founding work of the church. And that foundation, he says, only needed to be laid once. It was already laid by the apostles. And after all of the apostles' death, the other gifts would carry the work. So guess what we're doing? Carrying on the work. And now, even though we have not received apostleship in the same way as Paul, we have all received grace and a commission to the nations. This commission is expressed here in this verse when it says, to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are in Rome. So Paul is in writing to the Romans, and this is, would be true for us, including you who are here in Duluth. So this means that when you and I placed our faith in Jesus Christ in the gospel, our entire course of life was set to obey Christ. The obedience of faith. We believe Christ and true faith is to obey him, albeit imperfectly. The goal of our life is now to honor Christ and serve Christ. And don't miss here, look at the text, the exclusiveness of the phrase for his name's sake. Everybody see that? You see you in there? You see me? You see Anchor Point? No, I don't. Your name's not there, neither is mine. Sorry if that disappoints you. But the goal is to make much of Christ among the nations and little of you. Christ be magnified among the nations. Christ be magnified in Ethiopia. Christ be magnified in Duluth. For his name's sake. That's the heart of the Christian. Is a burning passion for the glory of Christ to be no made known among the nations of the world. 
And Paul then writes to all those who are in Rome, who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace and peace to you from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. So in these opening seven verses, Paul's emphasis is he and us, we are servants of God set apart, servants of Christ set apart for the gospel of God. Do you believe that? Before you are anything else, that's who you are. And the overflow of this, we see in verses 8 to 14, is first of all that we are blessed by and under our obligation to preach the gospel. Look at it in verse 8. For I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you Romans because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. That is an astounding statement. One of the greatest reasons And a reason that we will always have to thank God through Christ is because many have believed the gospel. Paul is so thankful that even in Rome, a place he had wanted to go, he had never been there yet, he can say, I know you've believed the gospel. Many of you have. And he wants to encourage them when he says, because your faith, your faith is proclaimed in all the world. In other words, do you know that the faith that you believed in, in Christ is being proclaimed where I'm at here? And it's being proclaimed all over the world. You're not alone, Rome, Romans. Anchor point, we're not alone. Do you know that as we sit here right now in Ethiopia, the gospel is being proclaimed. Praise be to God. That is an occasion to say, thank you, God. Praise be to you. And now we see his heart in the, and continuing in the, in the verse. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers. The Romans are always on his mind in prayer. And here's his request, asking that somehow, by God's will, I may now at last succeed in coming to you. Evidently, there were delays. Paul could not wait to get to Rome. I've had the privilege of talking to some of the team who was going to Ethiopia. They can't wait to go. And it's finally come. And here we see that there's a bond among believers that includes a longing to see one another. Paul longed to see believers he had never met. Why? Because of their common faith in the gospel. This bond is unbroken. It's one that looks at other brothers and sisters in Christ as believers first and no more, no longer in categories of race, color, or class, You're a believer. You're my brother. You're my sister. And I long to see you. So we have reason to thank God, Anchor Point, all the time. Because our faith in Christ is being proclaimed all over the world. And wherever we go, whether it's Ethiopia, we can be eager to know that there's believers and Paul expresses here that, it, that he has been praying for a very long time that he might finally get to see his Roman brothers and sisters who he's never met. Why does he want to see them? Well, he tells us. Look in verse 11. For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. Don't you just love the humility of Paul? He's an apostle. He's like, I just want to bless you. That's it. I'm not going to make much of me. I'm about making a name for Christ. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. Paul's like, I I simply want to see you and find some way to be a blessing to you and strengthen you. I don't want to take anything from you. I want to be mutually encouraged by you. So our Ethiopia team, they're going to be encouraged by the Ethiopian brothers and sisters. They will. 
and they want to go to be an encouragement to them. Because we're all on the same team, serving the same Lord. Now this mutual faith here, in today's world, we have to be clear. This is very specific. This is not ecumenical and inclusive. Meaning, what you believe and what I believe may be different, and we should encourage one another's different faiths. No, absolutely not. This faith is exclusively in the Son of God. This is what the gospel that binds us together. We are mutually blessed by one another. In verse 13, he says, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented. We don't necessarily know why. But he goes on, in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. Again, he just so longs to reap souls for Christ. And then verse 14, I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. Therefore, or so, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. In verse 14, Paul says, I am under obligation. Anchor point, listen, we are too. This isn't just for Paul. If you are a believer in Christ, you are under obligation to preach the gospel, to tell people about the Son of God who rose from the dead. There's good news that the world needs to hear, that the nations need to hear. Who's going to tell them? We'll just leave it up to Josh. We'll just leave it up to Paul. No, we're all, anchor point, we're under obligation, under command of Christ. Preach my name. Unapologetically. Be eager to do this. Some of you will go to the nations with your life. Others of you will stay in Duluth your whole life. Either way, make the name of Jesus known. As a church, we must keep growing in a kind of a we are eager to preach the gospel to you who are also in Rome attitude. Have this for our mission for our entire church and our lives. Because, as we've seen so far, we are servants set apart for the gospel, are we not? And we are blessed by and under obligation to preach the gospel. And in verses 16 to 17, what we see is the reason we are unashamed of the gospel because it is not a mere message. Look at verses 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jews, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Why was Paul not ashamed of the gospel? It's because he knew precisely what it was and what it was not. The modern mood of the gospel these days and sharing the gospel is apathetic, reluctance. Kind of cross your fingers. I hope they believe. Just kind of leave them alone. Don't ruffle the feathers too much. Don't disturb the peace. You do that too long, they could go to hell. And they will have no peace forever. Do you believe that? You got to tell people the truth of the gospel. Not prance around it to keep peace. For the sake of their peace. I'm not ashamed of it. We are debtors, anchor point, to the world. If the gospel has come to us, which it has, we have no liberty to keep it to ourselves. We must never be ashamed of it. Because we know what it is and what it isn't. It is not, for example, good advice. 
It is God's power for salvation. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is, here it is. You want to know what the gospel is? Here it is, right here. The power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. So the world offers good advice every day. But God offers his power. The good advice of the world may offer the world some temporary help. Maybe find a job. A better marriage. Fill in the gap. But it cannot offer them salvation. Salvation is the umbrella New Testament term for justification, sanctification, and glorification. So justification happened the moment you believed and set your life to obey Christ. God at that moment said, you're mine forever. You've been bought and purchased by my son's blood. You are right in my eyes, never to be wrong again. You're alive. And sanctification is the lifelong journey of obeying Christ, being shaped ever increasingly after his image. You are being made alive. You are alive in justification. You're being made alive in your sanctification. And glorification is the final end of your salvation. In other words, you and I will finally be fully alive forever at the return of Christ. New heaven, new earth, salvation. That is power, folks. Such the world has never seen and cannot offer. The good advice the world can offer, why would we ever, why in the dickens would we settle for giving people good advice when good news is offered to them? Notice the verse says, who it's for? It's to everyone who believes. To the Jews first and also to the Greeks. So the gospel is for everyone. Now, that does not mean everyone will believe, but it does mean everyone must be told. To the Jews first simply means the message of the gospel in the gospels went to the Jews first, and then it went to the Gentiles. And read through that in the gospels. So we are obligated, Anchor Point, to give our neighbors, to give our city, to give the nations the gospel because we know what it is. It is God's power for our salvation and theirs. Anchor point, just listen to me for a minute. If we really want to see the power of God in our city, you want to see it? We must be more zealous and less embarrassed about the gospel. A church that is embarrassed by the gospel has no power. Because being unashamed of the gospel is tied to seeing God's power to save people. And Satan is out there. I dare you to talk about Jesus. And you know what? The majority of the church today is saying, Ah, I might offend them. You might see them saved and experience the power of God. And you probably will. So don't refer to the the gospel as it's good advice. It's not. Secondly, it's not self help. Paul says here it's God's righteousness revealed from faith for faith. So the gospel is God's saving power because in its message is how God's righteousness was revealed. You see that? Say that again. The gospel is God's saving power because in its message is how God's righteousness is revealed. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith 
for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So it is a message by faith that we believe. It's not a self-help solution. If you do this with your life, things will go better for you. Do you know, be real clear. If you believe the gospel, that is not a guarantee that your marriage is going to get better. Some of you are like, wait a minute. In places in the world, when Muslims profess faith in Christ, kicked out of the home. It may not. It could. It could redeem that family. But it's not a guarantee that you're going to get a good job either. You might actually go to prison for the sake of his name. So don't refer to the gospel. Don't give people, if you believe the gospel, your life is going to get better. That's not the gospel. The gospel is that God's righteousness showed up and appeared in the world to remove the wrath of God from them if they believe. Now, yes, there, could be, there can be benefits to believing the gospel, for sure. But the gospel is about God's righteousness that showed up in human form. Righteousness describes God's character together with his actions, which are in keeping with his character. He's altogether good. In the gospel of his son, Jesus Christ, a righteousness, a rightness from God came to the world in the form of a person. It was revealed. And those who believe, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 actually become the righteousness of God. That's their identity. So look right here. If you've believed in Christ, do you know that right now you are the righteousness of God? That's how he looks at you. God's righteousness is his initiative in putting sinners back right with himself by giving them a righteousness which is not their own, it's his. He has done it through who? That's a question. Christ and nobody else. So why, so again, why is it so necessary not to offer good advice or self-help solutions or worldly counseling to people? There's no power there. Z- like zero, big fat zero. None. The power is in the gospel. It is necessary because, as we're going to see now in verses 18 and following, it's because their condition is not trivial. God's wrath is revealed against the unrighteous people. Look at it in verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Now, in verse 16, the gospel is the power of God. In verse 17, the righteousness of God is revealed and now we see the wrath of God. Now, as we go through this, I want to preface it. Because anytime you you can read through this, and maybe you've heard messages, I'm like, like you're preaching this angry. Darn right, the wrath of God is on them. Where's that coming from? Not the gospel. I say that on the basis of two texts Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of the world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom all of us, anchor point, at once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, 
like the rest of mankind. Verse 4, the good news. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Remember that when you talk about the wrath of God. Upon the unrighteous sinner. You were one of them, and his wrath was on you. But God saved you. Second text is Romans 9. Paul says these words. I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. Here's why. I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. That is a strong statement of humble heart. I wish that I would go to hell if it meant my brothers went to heaven. That's the kind of heart that the gospel produces for people. So remember that. Remember these two texts as we go through the wrath of God. Because this is, this is Paul's just desperate plea. This is the truth. Don't miss his heart here. Verse 18 again, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. This verse tells us very clearly that God is angry at truth suppressors. And he is not indifferent towards sin and sinner or sinners. He is not a stoic sovereign. He is rightfully raging right now against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of people who suppress the truth. And here's why. They're assaulting his name. They're assaulting his world and his image bearers. If he would not be wrathfully opposed to that, he would cease to be good. God's wrath is his holy hostility to evil and his refusal to condone it or come to terms with it because he knows it kills people. Why would a loving God condone what kills people? He wouldn't. Notice it says here that his wrath is revealed. So Paul wrote these words in the mid-first century. So God's wrath was being revealed then, and it's being revealed now as we read it. So don't read this as this is going to happen in the future. God's wrath is exhibited every day against those who suppress the truth of God for a lie. Every day. This word suppress means to cast aside, to push, hold down, do it my way. Remember when Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free and then points to himself as the truth? When people suppress the truth they're cast of the gospel, they cast aside, they push down their own freedom from bondage and sin. They are living in a lie, and that lie, grievously so, brings the wrath of God upon them. The truth of God's wrath upsets our modern sentiments. It's too disconcerting, too intolerant. Shouldn't talk about it. Talk about just the loving Jesus. We live in a day where we have set ourselves as the judge and put God's character on trial. You obey us, God. And the truth that Paul has in mind here, the truth that is being suppressed, is seen in the beginning of verse, eight, verse 19. Take a look. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. 
For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. Therefore, or so, they are without excuse. So, unseen attributes of God, eternal power of God, divine nature of God, all have been clearly perceived. Paul's argument here is the creation is a visible disclosure of the invisible God. It is evident. He exists. And he's good. Somewhat like an artist who finishes his masterpiece masterpiece and writes his signature on it and then displays his creation to his prize creation, human beings, and they thumb their nose at it and say, eh, we want to be our own masterpiece. They suppress the truth. Verse 21, for although they knew God, they did not, and here it is, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. So here we see not only were they suppressors of the truth, but also that they do not honor God or give thanks to him. And the result of this, we see the first layer of God's wrath at the end of this verse. They became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Futile thinking, darkened hearts. When people reject God, suppress the truth of God, the first evidence is what it does to their mind. This word futile means fruitless and unprofitable. It doesn't mean that they're not intelligent. doesn't mean that they can't hold a job. doesn't mean any of that. But it's, it's fruitless, unprofitable. It's futile for experiencing true life, the life that they were created for. And the heart is the center of the inner life. From the heart, a person's direction is determined. And Paul says, a dark cloud descends over those who do not honor God, who do not thank God, and continue to suppress the truth of God. They all live under the shadow. And their inner life descends further and further into darkness, though they may consider it progress. Take a look at verse 22. Claiming to be wise. Everybody see that? They became fools. We are so wise. We're progressing in our understanding of how the world works and the meaning of life. And we know for sure it's not honoring God or giving thanks to him. He doesn't matter. He's not that big of a deal to my life anymore. Notice the word fool. They became fools. Fools is not an adjective here. It's a noun. They are not foolish as a description of them, but fools as an identifier. This is who they are. Keep in mind, you were once one too. Don't forget that. The New English translation says it well. They boast of their wisdom, but they have made fools of themselves. Verse 23 is the nub of it. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Suppress the truth, refuse to honor God and thank God, and now we see why there was an exchange that happened. The glory of God for the glory of something else. Images in creation. Now here I want to see especially the first. Images made to look like a mortal man. Everybody see that? We may not see literal statues of mortal people in our culture everywhere. You would have probably if you were in the first century. But that does not mean they don't exist today. In his great book, I really commend it to you, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, Carl Truman writes this, the language of morality as now is used 
is really nothing more than the language of personal preference, my truth, your truth, which is a weird way of thinking, based on nothing more than sentiment and feeling. Essentially, emotivism alone presents preference as truth. I feel this way, therefore it's true. That's what happens to a culture. It's what happens to individuals when they make this exchange, the glory of God for the glory of themselves. Anything goes. So, we see the effects of this. This is tragic, but true. God gave them up to the dishonoring uses of their bodies. Verse 24, therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, and here it is, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. Because they exchanged, again, the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever and ever. Amen. So idolatry, exchanging, the glory of God for an idol. Idolatry will always display itself in the dishonoring of the physical body, bodies of God's image bearers. It always does. Dishonoring, and sadly today, what we're seeing among kids, the mutilation. And say, it's okay. Wicked. And God gave them up to dishonorable passions with their bodies. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonoring passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature, and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committed shameless acts with men and received in them the due penalty for their error. We'll see the penalty here in a minute. A descent further and further into sexual immorality. When idolatry happens, when the exchange happens, immorality follows and total decay of the human race. 100% of the time. Now, I want to say a word here about LGBTQ+, and whatever other letters will be added in the next three months. Full disclosure, I have never personally had a homosexual thought in my life. I haven't. And I find that sins that we are not familiar with experientially are generally the sins that we oppose the strongest. How could you? How could you feel that way? I've never felt that way. But here's the deal. I've had other sins and struggles. And so, this isn't the unpardonable sin. It's sin, yes. But remember, you too once walked in the desires of your flesh and needed to be saved. God gave them up. God gave them up. And what's the penalty they received? Paul says, the due penalty for their error. What is it? Look at verse 28. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, here's the penalty. God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. Dishonoring use of their bodies, dishonorable passions with their bodies, and finally, in the end, the final analysis, a debased mind. This word debased here is literally immoral. It's the lowest of the low you can get. You don't get worse than a debased mind. And he goes on to describe a debased mind. They are filled with all kinds of unrighteousness. Verse 29, they were filled with all manner. Not, this doesn't mean 
all the way to the max. But they're filled with all of these kinds of things. Unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to their parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Such too were you before Christ. So too was I before the gospel. Though they, and this is, the, this is the lowest of the low, this is the ultimate expression of the wrath of God, that though they knew God's righteous degree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. If that is not true in our culture right now. Anchor point, listen. We are servants set apart for the gospel of God. We are blessed by and under obligation to preach the gospel. And we are unashamed of the gospel because we know it's not merely a message. It's the power of God. It's the revelation of his righteousness. And it's needed because of the wrath of God. And we realize, final point, we realize the necessity, therefore, of the gospel. I hope you realize the necessity of it. That if people die without hearing Christ and believing it, the scripture is very clear, they go to hell forever. The gospel is necessary because there is such thing as the wrath of God. Only the gospel of God provides deliverance from that wrath. So the nations must hear it. Your neighbor must hear it. The most irresponsible, to use a metaphor, the most irresponsible action of a doctor would be to acquiesce in a patient's inaccurate self-diagnosis. Our Christian commission is rather through prayer, strength of the Holy Spirit, in relationship with the lost, to bring people to accept the truth somehow, some way of their true diagnosis and their condition in the sight of God and not condone it or support it in any way. We cannot suppress the truth and expect a righteous outcome for people. We must realize, again, that we were dead in our trespass. We were this description. We had the wrath of God upon us. You did. So did I. And so do Millions of people in the world. I don't think the gospel is necessary. We must have a heart like Paul who said, in view of all of this, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of the lost. Let's pray. Father, there's so much here in this chapter. and God, I know I went way over time. May Anchor Point forgive me. But I pray that we would not get caught up by that right now. And that we would be a church unashamed of the gospel because we know it is your power to save people. And we would realize afresh the necessity of it and spend our whole lives, whatever we do, whatever career we have, whatever you do in life, we would spend our whole lives knowing we are first servants of you, Lord Jesus Christ, and set apart for your gospel May we give it to the nations, give it to Duluth, give it to the Northland for the sake of your name and not ours. In Jesus' name, amen.